and I looked to Global Chief Economist at UBS, Paul Donovan, to continue the case for the proposition. Thank you, Mr. President, for the opportunity to speak once again in this chamber after a brief pause of 30 years. And on a topic which is going to shape the world for the next 30 years. We stand at the brink of the most significant change to the global economy in 250 years, what economists refer to as the fourth industrial revolution. This is the process of automation, robotics, digitization, social media, and so forth. And this is bringing about profound change. Because the point about an industrial revolution is it's revolutionary. It's not just the economy that is being tweaked. This is society that is undergoing a radical transformation. How we work, where we work, what we do at work is all going to change. How we consume, where we consume, and what we consume is already changing. And in this environment, we are building the shape of society in the future. This is not just about money. This is about the existence of humanity on this planet. Because at the very core of the fourth industrial revolution is the idea of increased efficiency, doing more with less, which is absolutely essential to the sustainability crisis that we are already in. The point about the fourth industrial revolution is that it is not the technology that makes the difference. Everyone gets it, it's seduced by the shiny new toy of technology. Economists do not. I would still be using a BlackBerry if I could. It is not the technology that matters. It is how we use the technology that matters. Five years ago, I bought myself a new laptop. What did this change in the world? It changed nothing. March 2020, what happens? I flee London with all the poise of a 16th century aristocrat fleeing the Black Death. I go back to my home in Wiltshire, I bolt the gates, I check I've got shotgun cartridges, and I start using that laptop differently. I use the laptop to work from home. That single action has changed real estate demand. It has changed energy use. It has changed transportation. It has changed food demand. I am not buying an overpriced sandwich from Pret-a-Manger anymore. I'm making my own cheese and pickle sandwich in my own kitchen. The point here is that it is how we use the technology that changes the world. And what that means is that the mantra for the next 30 years is getting the right person in the right job at the right time, because that, more than anything else, is going to make sure that we maximize the benefits of the fourth industrial revolution and we turn around the sustainability crisis. Now, our opponents, no doubt with the best of intentions, do not believe that the right person should be in the right job at the right time. No, they believe the right accent should be in the right job at the right time. That is what borders are doing. We have the physical borders where we have to wave our now sadly blue passports in order to pass. But on top of that, we have the mental borders that those physical borders start to produce. We start to think of people as others. And from thinking of people as others to thinking of people as less than is a very short step. We have to be more and more aware of the threats that borders are presenting. 
because as we go through a period of structural upheaval in the economy, we will see, without fail, a rise in scapegoat economics and prejudice politics. It has happened in every single industrial revolution we have had so far, and we can already see it happening before our eyes today. People naturally faced by the turmoil of a more complex world will say, well, it's, it's not my fault I lost my job. And from their individual perspective, it probably isn't. But then they want a simple solution. It's not my fault I lost my job. It's the fault of that immigrant. It's the fault of that foreigner. There are too many women in the workforce. It's the moral decay of same-sex marriage. Whatever absurdity is being printed on the front page of their dubious quality tabloid newspaper. And as a result, we then go from uh, scapegoat economics into prejudice politics. The unscrupulous politician who will come along and say, of course it's not your fault. Of course we can go back to this mythical glorious past. Vote for me, we'll build a wall and keep them out. And that is where borders do their most poisonous worst. Technology today is allowing us ever more flexibility, more than ever before. We are reducing barriers to entry in culture. I grew up in a world of three television channels. The culture that I experienced was the culture that cis, white, bald, middle-aged men chose me to experience. Now, I have nothing against cis, white, bald, middle-aged men as a category, quite clearly. But I do not think that they should dictate the culture of an entire society. We are lowering the borders with technology. We are lowering the obstacles that exist. And yet our opponents wish to build them back up again. Our opponents are looking to build Trumpian walls on the crumbling foundations of yesteryear in order to cower behind because they are concerned about others. But borders are now an overly simplistic anachronism in an increasingly culturally diverse and complex organization. As you've heard, I'm a global economist for a global firm. We have a culture within our firm that we promote across all countries, regardless of border. Because if you work for my company, you have to follow certain standards. You have to have certain beliefs, otherwise you are not part of the culture of the company. As you've heard, I belong to the World Economic Forum's chief economists community, as wild and exciting a group as it sounds. <laughs> and this, again, is without borders, a republic of ideas exchanging economic thoughts around the world. I'm a member of an even larger global community, the LGBTQ plus community, which has its own political structures. Grinder is our House of Commons, Scruff is our House of Lords. <laughs> I would have far more in common with any other member of the LGBT community on this planet than with the P.G. Woodhouse caricatures lounging on the Treasury bench in another house. I am not defined by, nor do I wish to be imprisoned by, an accident of geography. I would urge our opponents to disentangle themselves from the Union Jack bunting that they seem to have got caught up in, and to embrace the 21st century, a world without borders.